uh, old with severe pneumonia, five lobes, pretty sick. Um, on admission in the ICU, he's already in refractory septic shock with noradrenaline up to 1.8 mics per kilo per minute. He's uh, also directly in ERDS with a PF ratio of 170. The CO2 is 75 millimeter mercury under protective ventilation. So from this point, we decide to insert a neck core with a CRT. And I will come back with some uh, image of this. Uh, we try to run at 450 ml per minute. It's very important to remove as much as possible CO2. And therefore, we are using a, 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 a technique that uh, we are using in our center, which is a double lumen catheter, a 14 French catheter in the right jugular, and then a 14 French catheter in the groin. And I will show you, we have a Y-piece intersection. And this allows us not to run for 24 hours if we had only one catheter, even 16, 17 French. But with two 14 French, we can run 48, 72 hours with an ECOR. And this is quite important in very sick patients. So the patient further deteriorate with a PF ratio of 110 and need of prone position required to improve oxygenation. Uh, we find a pneumococcus in blood culture and bronchial aspirate. And prone was attempted, but uh, the patient was hemodynamically too unstable, and we had to put him back on um, his back. So at this stage, what would you do? And please raise your hands. Would you consider a VV ECMO? If yes, raise your hands, please. Nobody? Mm. Uh, would you consider a VA ECMO? Raise your hands. Nobody? OK. Would you consider an ECOS therapy? If yes, raise your hands. OK. And so uh, last possibility, you would wait. If yes, raise your hands. So I suppose that uh, everybody would wait. OK, let's see. Anyway, we were considering uh, venovenous ECMO in this case. But finally, we wait. And we choose uh, ECOS therapy with a cytosorb. But you have to think that cytosorb is this case, in this case, is seen as a bridge therapy, bridge to offer another therapy, which I will come back, and not a destination therapy. It's not a go, uh, it's not a go to uh, treat the patient, but offer to uh, consider another therapy. So we start cytosol, and I will show you in picture, and after 12 hours, the noradrenaline dose went down to 0.2 mics per kilo per minute. And at this stage, we say, well, we really retry prone positioning. And because the ECOR is working well with uh, two uh, uh, separate teeters, we could run with a high peep up to 18 centimeters of water. And this is the, the setup where you have the machine, PrismaFlex at that time, and then you go out of the AN69 ST, surface treated, and you go into the baby oxygenator, so the ECOR, 
has been uh, put together with the perfusionists and with a rewarming system, and then goes back to the cytosol cartridge and then back to the patient. The patient is in prone, and despite the rewarming on the cartridge, we need to rewarm him uh, externally as well. This is what I told you. We have two separate catheter, double lumen here, that is in the uh, jugular, right jugular internal space. And then we have a Y piece here, trying to put the two uh, catheter together via a Y piece to the arterial part because we re-inject the blood into the jugular approach. Uh, the Y piece is very cheap, but it's quite a, a, a nice setup to improve the quality and the duration of uh, echo for us and at a high level 450 ml as I said. Below this uh, we don't have very good removal of CO2. Now, the PF ratio went up and above 200. We did a new session of cytosorb, which could reduce further down the noradrenaline to 0.02 mics per kilo per minute. And after three prone sessions, we followed the scheme uh, in the literature. Uh, the patient was on pressure support was exhibited after seven days, discharged after 12 days to the ward, and discharged from the hospital after three weeks, obviously. And again, I stress the fact that we use ECOS, in this case, as a bridge therapy, not to treat the disease, but to offer some space to treat the patient with uh, prone positioning, high peep, and um, echo. So we were lucky because at f for the same price, probably, we had to put a, a VV ECMO. We did an echocardiogram, and the patient had no cardio depression, so there was no need for a VV ECMO in that case. So having showed the case. Um, as I said yesterday, um, we need to invest a lot in uh, mechanistic study and mechanistic approach. And before we would run a randomized control trial. And this paper, which I did with Louis Forney and some other uh, co-authors, um, is really focusing on a mechanistic approach and a mechanistic uh, studies. And so we, we took the initial scheme from uh, Hotchkiss and uh, through the literature we could see five scenarios. Uh, if you have the pro-inflammatory response, the innate immunity, you could have a recovery, you could have an early death, cytokine storm, fulminant septic shock, and if you see if you can remove some cytokine here, perhaps you can avoid this. Uh, regarding the adaptive immunity and the anti-inflammatory response, you have two scenarios. Uh, you can have a recovery, you can go up to a fulminant septic shock, or immunoparalysis, and as well, the innate immunity can go to the immunoparalysis. So five scenarios, saying that in any case, what you have to do if you follow this is to remove pro and anti-inflammatory mediator, because you don't know in which case you will be. So. This is somewhat very different from the initial evaluation saying we should only remove pro and leave anti. It's not exactly the truth. 
probably it's much more complex than this, but ne nevertheless. And we have some proof in the literature, which I will show, is the st uh, one study of uh, John Callum uh, in 2007, uh, published in the archive of uh, internal medicine, and showing uh, having 2,000, almost 2,000 patients with community-acquired pneumonia coming to casualty, and uh, almost 600 of those will develop severe sepsis. We use severe sepsis at the time, not anymore, as you know. And look, when we look to the level of both IL-6 Pro, IL-10 Anti, when it's low, the mortality at 90 days is 5%. If it's very high, IL-6 and both IL-10, mortality is close to 50% at 90 days. So there is some um, uh, facts in the literature showing that removing very high level of both together, pro and anti-inflammatory, is making sense, at least in this study from uh, John Kellogg. But again, things are more complex and we need to really invest a lot to understand better. Just focus on this column here, where you have to uh, remove mediator, non-selective membrane like AN69 surface treated, only removing cytokine uh, of PMMA. Then you have semi-selective Osiris membrane, selective for endotoxin, and selective for cytokine. And then we go to the sorbonne, that's uh, polymyxin B, selective only for uh, endotoxin, and then cytosorb, and selective for um, cytokine. So in this case, we choose cytosorb because we believe we had to remove excess of cytokine um, pro and anti. Ideally, we should measure IL-6, IL-10 on the bedside and anotoxin to make sure that we do not need to remove anotoxin and that we have high level of IL-6 and IL-10. We will do this probably very soon in our unit. Now, I told you yesterday that the sorbonne has obviously a huge surface because of the beat structure instead of the capillary structure, and it's about 45,000 square meter, so four football pitch, compared to an EMA filter of only two square meter, a ping pole um, table. So we know that this uh, this cytosorber has a huge capacity to remove cytokine, although it can be struck after six hours, despite the huge surfaces. And now, if we look to the size selectivity of cytosol, we see that it's quite large. It's from uh, zero to 66. So almost double of the classical hemofilters and taking the trimer TNF of 51 dal kilodalton, free hemoglobin of 59 kilodalton, but not touching on albumin 67 kilodalton. There are a few studies showing that it's been able to re uh, reduce uh, noradrenaline uh, need uh, not mortality, it's very too early to speak about mortality right away. And um, this is a study from a German group, 20 consecutive patients with refractory septic shock. Cytosol was start early, 7.8 hours after the beginning of noradrenaline, that's very important. Uh, following the initiation, they could reduce noradrenaline after six hours, and this was significant and 12 hours, lactate clearance improved significantly. Shock reversal was achieved in 13, 65% of the patient, and 20-day uh, 
survival was 45 versus expect 80, but this study was not um, structure for mortality. Just forget about this. But at least th that study showed that they could reduce noradrenaline. Now, there is a, a prospective randomized pilot study from uh, an Hungary group from Zolt Molnar. And this shows again that selectivity, selection, sorry, of the patient is very crucial. Look, they had at the beginning, they, they screen more than 700 patients. They exclude almost 700 patients for presence of AKI, PCT not reaching three nanograms per ml, and our requirement above, not above 10 mics per ml, so 0.3 mics per kilo per minute, almost. Uh, no, no access to invasive hemodynamic monitoring, another reason. Then randomization in the two group. And what they got is that the norepinephrine in micrograms per kilo per minute, although higher in the cytosol group in dotted green line, went down significantly at T48 hours with a p-value below 0 0.05. So it seems to work, probably not in every case of UC. Um, and then we have also the registry in Europe, uh, which is now about uh, more than 50,000 patients altogether. And what we can see from the, um, this um, slide here is that when we compare the mortality in blue according to the Apache score, we see that the observed mortality with cytosol uh, is only better than the mortality of, uh, according to the Apache score, when you have a, an Apache score about 25, 30, or even above 35. So very sick patient, but early treatment is very important. Now, if I may conclude. Cytosorb is the most powerful tool for cytokine removal in the last 30 years. Sepsis reversal of shock and early MOF is often seen, not always, obviously. Start within six hours if, if possible. Change the cartridge after six, eight hours because it's struck very easily. Um, try to choose very sick patient, but uh, early on. Uh, and think always as a bridge therapy. Do not think as a destination therapy. You will not cure the patient with this. You will allow to do another therapy that's going to maybe cure the patient. This is a very different approach. It's too early. We need probably years to get the, uh, the, the answer about the destination therapy regarding this. Should be used to prevent excessive inflammation also in bypass surgery. And the safety is pretty good, as you can see. No major uh, adverse event. Only one case of anaphylaxis, but which was uh, directly responding to one milligram of adrenaline, and the patient had no uh, consequences. But you need to this, keep this in mind. And promising clinical data, but too early to assess mortality and need of mechanistic study. Thank you so much for your kind attention. And lastly, echo prone can be effective in ARDS. Thank you so much for your kind attention. Uh, I think uh, this class is supposed to be a, a workstation. So we will like to have some interaction from the audience those who have experience. How many of you have any experience of using extracorporeal therapies in septic patient? Lobo sir, I can see he's been an authority here in India. So any anyone from the audience who's been three, four? So
So we have uh, tried to get few filters available in India are commonly used as of now in uh, Hyderabad. Uh, people who are not completely acquainted, you can see it. This is Cytosov, which Patrick sir has been demonstrating. It has a huge surface area of 45,000 square that is almost equal to four football stadium as he demonstrated. And this is another one from uh, company from Zafron. It is HA330. It is again, I come again in my presentation. Uh, and another one is from Tore. Toro has two things. One is Toramixin and another one is Hemophil. Toramixin, uh, it is a polymixin be implanted fibers, immobile fibers. Another one is Hemophil, which works as on base of absorption as well as hemofiltration. So it's a slightly modified, it contains PMMA fiber, it has its adsorption properties. And this one is Oxaris filter. This goes into only Prismaflex. And among all the filters, this is the only filter which claims or it has a good report of removal of both endotoxins as well as cytokines. Most of other filters, they target cytokines. This are uh, the only one they claim that are, it has proven, but yes, for, for all filters, there is no RCT proven. There are only small case series or prospective observational, retrospective observational studies. In, in our experiences, people who are commonly using, yes, it's not like 80%, 90%, but it is one, as Sir said, Patrick Sir said, it's a, one of the bridge therapy, you give this, try to support the patient in other ways and try to get the result. I will go for my presentation. Okay. So, um, as a clinician, what I like to do is um, to, as I said, to measure at least IL-6 on the bedside and, uh, and the toxin, because then I can choose the therapy. If I have both IL-6 and endotoxin, uh, AN69 Osiris is the best choice. If I only IL-6 without anotoxin, then I think cytosol is the best choice to start with. If I have only anotoxin alone, I think then that uh, polymixin B is the best choice. So I think measuring is very important, not only at the beginning, but during the whole treatment to see how many cartridge do I need to treat completely the patient and to get down the IL-6, IL-10, as I show you in the beginning, and also uh, the endotoxin level. Because we know that endotoxin can also be released uh, from the gut uh, sometime two or three days later of the initial insult. So, uh, I mean, measuring at the start and then monitoring is very important, in my view. A any questions from the audience? Yeah, please. Uh, a microphone for the... Another question. Please, Michael, uh, more thank you very much. That was a wonderful talk. My point is, uh, I, I agree with Oxaris. Obviously, it has a long uh, run over this concept. Except other filters, which are short life, like Cytosol, four to six hours or eight hours, and we know that when we are suppressing the uh, cytokine storm initially, and we suddenly stop that particular thing, there is a rebound phenomena. So don't you think that a filter with a short lifespan of four to six hours, if not again repeated at least for a 24 hours so that we can reduce or stop the pulse coming out of the cytokine, that does not add much value to the treatment part? I fully agree with you. Uh, I mean, you have two ways to try to monitor this. Uh, the ideal ways of UC to measure IL-6, and if you have a rebound, obviously you have to carry on with a new filters. The other way is to try to see the, the evolution of the noradrenaline uh, load. If you have in the initial phase uh, a, a descent of noradrenaline, 
and after six hours, you see you have to re-increase noradrenaline. This is a good sign that your cartridge is full and that you have still a lot of cytokine on board of the blood of the patient and that you should start a second cartridge and so on. Sometimes, as you said, you have to, to, um, to uh, use three, four, five cartridge and, uh, until the patient is stabilized and also, in some case, the patient is never stabilized and probably going to die. But so I fully on, agree. Yeah, on that point, my one question is just a query. So, have you have any experience of continuously using a filter, for example, cytosol, considering within six hours we know it's not going to work? So, instead of like uh, continuing the therapy without cytosol, continue changing the filter at least four filters a day maybe four to six filters for at least 24 hours so that we can reduce the pulses coming out of cytosine. Rather, it becomes a very expensive aspect. Yeah. I have some experience, I have experience, but I use also cytosol for intoxication and uh, there I can use the same cytosol cartridge for 48 hours most of the time because the stacking is not the same like in, uh, in um, in septic shock patient, but in some septic shock patient, I have been able to use it for 24 hours, 36 hours. So it's not the, all the patient that would need a change after six, eight hours, I agree. No, uh, my question is like, as you just said, that we need to monitor the, yeah? the, the dosing of NORAD, whether it's going up and down. So instead of uh, like, for example, at six hours, if we believe, do you think after six hours we add a new filter, remove the previous one, and continue to have four to six filter over the period of 24 hours to completely suppress the cytokine storm? So, so, so your idea is to put first a cytosol and then uh, an Osiris filter after? No, no. no. Yes. You need to so repeat. I'm saying, I'm, I'm saying over the period of 24 hours, use four cytosop continuously without any gap. So he, oh. he, he answered that question in the first half. I think you didn't get the question. See, he says you can have two ways to measure the need of no, continuity. I got, I got that. I got that. Continuity of cytosol requirement after six hours, if you have a molecular way of measuring IL-6 levels, if it is dipping, is one way. The other way is if in spite of your cytosol, your norad is started tapering, again it started going up. So you need a repeat of uh, cytosol. Yeah. The yeah. question is how many, how much time? Yes, so that's what I'm saying. Like at least what, what I think that over the period of 24 hours, at least continuously, if you are able to suppress the cytokine storm, so the rebound is usually not that stronger. Two, three, four. Continuous cytosols. How many we can use? Well, we can use three, two, three, four, five, but obviously, as you said very well yourself, it's a question of cost as well. Right, right. So that's obviously the big, big issue. But I, I think if you have a young patient in refractory septic shock with no comorbidity, then maybe you can put uh, some money to buy uh, some cytosol and to use four or five if needed, as I said. Okay. So, it's okay? okay? Thank you, thank you. Okay. Just wanted to ask, like in case uh, we have attached a cytosol to a CRRT machine and we continue to use the CRRT circuit for say around about 72 hours or so, so do we need to remove this, like the uh, clinical need for uh, cytosol has already gone, so do we ne need to remove the CRRT, the cytosol filter or can just keep it running? Uh, so will it have any deleterious effects? This is a very good question. No, we don't need to stop the CRRT. We can make the change in uh, one or two minutes max because we are clearing the cytosol before and this take about uh, 30 minutes and when we are ready we clamp the two sides and then we insert the new cytosol and we don't lose the CRT uh, uh, circuit. The question is not that. The question is the need for cytosol has gone so if I keep the circuit here. Yeah. Okay. Or every 
No. I mean, need for cytosol is not there, but do I need to remove it or the, if I just no, continue no. using a, it? That's an excellent question. Um, no, I think uh, what we do and uh, what we do in the uh, in all the place, I think it's to keep the cytosol on site because, um, as you said, it's always a risk for the circuit if you remove it. If you have to remove it, you have to take the risk. Yes. If not, no, you leave the cytosol uh, in the circuit. Doesn't make any uh, big difference for the circuit. The reason of asking that question was in one of the meetings, there was a discussion whether the cytokine which has got adsorbed to the surface, does it release back into the That's a very good question. Yeah. So far, there are a few studies showing that there are some um, deabsorption um, I showed this also yesterday, uh, should be around 5 to 10%. Okay. So if your patient is deteriorate, then maybe you should remove the cartridge, cartridge. and then uh, uh, wait for a few hours to see if restabilize. And if not, you have to put a new cartridge. But you're fully right about the absorption. Yes. yes. Thank you. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for the opportunity, Renowned Clinical Services, Chakravarti Sir and team. Uh, this is my privilege to get an opportunity here. So, my topic today, you already know. I discuss my presentation two cases. In between, I'll break. Let's go. So, this is a patient, 64 year old female, presented with, as previous, she has doesn't have any chromorbidities, presented with a fever and chills, loose tools, and multiple episodes of vomiting over the last three days. Once she received, she initial treatment was outside. Uh, they have given some her antibiotic, basic antibiotics and fluid resuscitation, but her condition was deteriorating in terms of her urine output is getting decreased and she started retaining fluid. So she came here. By the time she, she landed with us, her heart rates were around 120, temperature was 100 plus, blood pressures are reasonably fine, no supports at that time. Respiratory are slightly high, around 28, and saturations were 97 on room air. Sensorium was intact, not much in pain, and the skin was dry, and pulse was bonding. On systemic examination, CVS except sinus tachycardia, there was no other signs. In respiratory systems wise, there is tachypnea is present, bilateral air entry is good. My, our provisional diagnosis initially at that time was acute febrile illness for evaluation. Initial labs, uh, TLC is around 13,000, platelets 1.5 lakhs, creat 1.2, sodium was 119 and transamine it is around 2 to 3 times the basic value and bilirubin is 3.22, CRP is 3.01 and Procal is 2.6. CT abdomen with contrast was done, suggestive of mild hepatomegaly, retroperitoneal lymphadenopathy, pyelonephritis changes, no obstruction or no hydronephrosis and there were cystitis changes. CT chest, bilateral minimal pleural effusion and minimal consultation with axillary lymphadenopathy. ABG, respiratory alkalosis with metabolic S-dosis, the bicarbs around 17 with basics of 7 to 8. Today echo was completely normal. Awaited investigations were cultures, baseline cultures which we sent and tropical workup. Uh, the we kept a final diagnosis of possible UTI. So once we receive into the ICU, we started with BLBLA antibiotics. We continued, we have not hydrated much because her vasopressor supports are not high, she was not in shock, but restrictive fluid strategy we continued. Sodium correction was started. Over the next 36 hours, patient condition has not improved. She's slowly gone into kind of developing mods, like she developed a new onset AF with FER, increasing creatinine with preserved urine output, thrombocytopenia of 60,000, no change in TLC. And gradually, her sensorium started dipping down with restlessness. Maybe intermittently, she's requiring NIV. As initial cultures were negative, tropical, so, far, uh, so as was tropical workup, as a team, her Procal and CRP considering we have escalated to broad spectrum because it's been touching 48 hours. And we took an urology consultation because of pyelonephritis, because there was no obstruction kind of, there are no hydronephrosis. Uh, the decision was not to intervene at this point of time with it because there is hardly any benefit. 
So, what are the options left with me now as a critical care in charge because I have to coordinate with urologist, I have to explain the physician as well as nephrologist because we work as a team. So, as for me, I have to wait and watch or what are your options, what do you do if you are in this state? Anyone? Any comments, sir? Lower, sir, or anyone to low? See, this is a, not a very uncommon scenario in many of our intensive care unit. Uh, see, uh, many patient who comes with unexplained multi-organ failure, we stuck them there. Uh, what maximum you can do is stabilize your hemodynamics and homeostasis and give antimicrobials. After that, uh, uh, with organ support, you, uh, you will be wait and watch phenomenon. So, with that wait and watch, we have seen the mortality remain to be extremely high. So, I think repeatedly we are asking uh, the same questions to all of you. At certain point after, after initial standard of care, which all of you understand, evaluating for all possible etiology, giving appropriate cover. In this case, probably uh, I will take care of a retroperitoneal lymphadenopathy, hepatomegaly, hepatosplenomegaly, or tropical cover, or negative. I will consider a salmonella in this case, a tropical which has not been detected, uh, a doxycycline in this case, and keeping a watch on a gram-negative septicemia which has not been picked up. The culture sometimes may not be yielding all. So these three will be my differentials. But anyway, you are on, already on a carbipenem or a cephalosporins which covers your salmonella or adding a doxycycline will just consider to add up your any tropical which has not been yet picked up. Other than that, if my patient's organ dysfunctions are worsening and you are on the escalation doses of uh, vasopressors and you are not able to um, come back to a baseline, then what next is the question. So. Any modalities we can consider here, what are the different therapies or different modalities? Yes. So can we use cytosol in this setting? Why do you think cytosol? Because uh, cytokines might be uh, the players which are causing this multi-organ dysfunction. Why, why not the other filters? Uh, because they are for endotoxin and the cultures have not yielded anything right now. So, as sir has suggested, we can measure the IL-6 and endotoxin level and uh, according to them, we can choose the filters. So, that's one way of thinking. So, you think the, we can go for an IL-6 levels and endotoxin assess and decide on that which filter you can use on that, maybe one way of that. So, we'll go to the case and then we'll come back to you. The other uh, thing that we need to think about is uh, we have thought of only an infective etiology, sir. Also, because there is a multi-organ involvement, uh, we should always consider in our common practice uh, an autoimmune etiology has to be ruled out. Uh, sometimes autoimmune diseases can be triggered off by an infective etiology and there can be a rapid course downside. So that is one other differential diagnosis that we need to consider. The other possibility, apart from the standard of care, if the unit has uh, measures uh, to test the endotoxin assay, which will give us uh, whether it is gram-negative septicemia, that is one thing that, because in, if at all we are trying to use any kind of uh, adsorptive therapy, uh, it is always good to have a baseline endotoxin assay. So, my setup has, doesn't have an endotoxin assay, but we do IL-6 levels, uh, which we used to do. Uh, in this scenario, what we have done is, we have sent for a bl blood for sepsis panel, which comes a bit early. Along with, we repeated her, our Procal and CRP. The Procal was raised significantly from 2 to almost 70. Following that, her hemodynamics started worsening. So, in this stage, I intervened with two sessions of hemo, because I have not given, I, uh, I mentioned here like directly like a two sessions of hemophil perfusion done over the next span of 36 hours. Following first session, there was a no great improvement. Overall, there is a decrease in the vasopressor support, but not overall sensorium or kind of respiratory distress. In fact, following the first session, she had from NAV, we required her to intubate. 
If I calculate her SOFA score over a period of 7 to 9 days, the day when I received her SOFA score was 4.25, the mortality is around 30 percent. But day 3 where she started deteriorating, her SOFA score become 11, where I intervened first. Following that next session, when I intervened, her SOFA score is around 13. But post 48 hours or within 36 to 48 hours of my post session, I completely weaned off her from NARAD, I could get her onto the CPAP support and she never required another session of dialysis. Her, yes, her creats were high, but urine output was maintained, breathing was much stabilized, sensorium is good and completely off vascular process. But I am not say, saying that this is the game changer. Meanwhile, my sepsis panel found to came to be Citrobacter and Enterococcus faecium or faecalis and CRP is coming to a decreasing trend. So, as Patrick sir said, it is a kind of bridge or I am trying to reduce or prevent my organ dysfunction rather than intervening late. Yes, as uh, Dr. V, uh, Vijay Tarvait, we have sent ANA, uh, but considering her age of a 60 years, presenting at 60 years with flared up autoimmune disease slightly goes in my thought process, yes, we need to evaluate. But to stabilize her, I will definitely give her a chance rather than establish darker functions. I want to intervene before rather than establishment of organ functions. So, my rationale are why we are doing this, what are the available filters, what the evidence is saying, what are the pitfalls and drawback and when. This is the most important in new devices. So, why we are doing we know that conventional sepsis or septic shock has been treated with fluids, antibiotics, source control, vasopressins as well as any organ support we are doing. But despite doing that, we have 40 percent mortality at the end of 28th day. And because of sepsis and septic shock, we have complete disarray of our immune system, completely dysregulation leading to MOTS as well as immunoparalysis. Because of immunoparalysis, we have a new onset of hospital acquired infections which are dreadful. So, we need to restore our immune homeostasis, for that we use extracorporeal therapies, the targets being either cytokine removal or endotoxins. This is what we can summarize or this is how it happens, when the pathogen attacks the body, there will be expression of pathogen associated molecular patterns which and endotoxins causing cytokine flare and cytokine storm. So, blood purification system attack this pathway at various levels and try to stop the cytokine storm. So, these, these are all the filters which are available, try to compare here. The toramycin which is polymyxin B inflated fibers, uh, it targets endotoxins. The prescription so far advised by so is every for 2 days, 2 hours. Anticoagulation we need to go for heparin and blood flow we need to maintain around 80 to 100. Additional advantage with this, the polymyxin B which is impregnated in the filter has antimicrobial effect. Yes, what is the evidence for this filter? So far is mixed. Positive results are very good positive results from Japan, but the study, u study which came from North America is not great and no randomized control study is supporting it. Second, second is hemophil which is again from Tore, uh, this target is it removes cytokines, the mechanism of action is adsorption and parallelly we can continue hemofiltration or we can do uh, parallel dialysis happens along with the hemofiltration happens. The one of the questions previously one of the audience asked can we run, yes with this filter we can run up to 12 to 18 hours, we have run it. But the problem with this filter is there is a high risk of thrombogenicity, we need to maintain our anticoagulation with this filter. And the pres usual prescription dose is up to 8 to 12 hours. And the supportive evidence is on a lower side, so far there is a much studies have to come or RCTs have to come, so far only observance studies are giving a positive. Another one is HA330. This contains sterile divinyl benzene polymers, it removes cytokines, complement factors and free hemoglobin, mechanism of action again adsorption. The prescription is 2 to 6 hours on 2 consecutive days, heparin or citrus is anticoagulation, blood flow is around 100 to 300. Two small RTCs around 40 plus patients gave a positive result, one observational study is on the neutral side. The auxiliaries 
it has a specialized membrane AN69, it treated with polyethylamine and heparin, it's a three layered, it works predominantly, it removes both endocrine and cytokines as we told. The prescribed dose is more than 35 ml per kg per hour. Anticoagulation, not much, heparin is advised, but it runs, it has heparin coated. Uh, evidence, it's a best in class if for endocrine or inflammatory mediator removal and hemodynamic stability and most of the studies on auxiliaries have supported it restores hemodynamic stability. And coming to cytosob, I think Patrick sir has told lot of details, so I skip this. Uh, I think with the sort of time, uh, we would like to take questions on that and a very interesting point which you made, I was also interacting. See, in those initial situation, as he pointed out, you may not have a definite diagnosis for initial 24, 48 hours. You have all dilemma. This patient may be a different scenario where we have little clue. But many situations, the patient lands up with multi-organ failure. We, by default, level it as a sepsis and organ failure. But you may have any scenarios. Many of them may not grow anything. You may not actually conclusively have an evidence of infection. So the next question comes, even though your workup goes for all your autoimmune panel, that may take its own time. Sometimes there may be ANA which is negative by IF uh, initially with the 40 cutoff, maybe it is positive by 100 cutoff, ANA profile may take time. So the question is, can I run this uh, EA in, in the context of where I have not clear evidence whether it is a sepsis or not a sepsis. Even though as we said, you can have an endotoxin assay, you can have IL-6 levels, you can have a cytokine uh, uh, assessments, then you can initiate. The point is if I have an autoimmune backdrop or I have a suspicion of autoimmune, the point is you may think about a plasma exchange there where you need to removal of an immunoglobulin which is a very high Dalton molecules and it is probably few million Daltons than what we are using a more middle molecule removal. So that may not be fitting here. So here this will not, no way going to help your autoimmune phenomenon. It is only about a hyper inflammatory phenomenon which we are talking about either a septic patient uh, flaring up or we sometimes see this happening with a trauma or a cardiopulmonary bypass or a pancreatitis or a burns. These are the context which are again considered as an hyperinflammation where you can overlap them. Again I think we repeatedly re-emphasized in the last couple of days with many uh, discussions yesterday and today that we still don't have any robust evidence strongly recommending their use as a standard of therapy in any of these settings. But in spite of our regular standard care, if we get into a junction where we are not finding an answer to help our patient, these can be used as an adjuvant. The next question is, at what time? How early? We are saying we need to be early, you cannot use it late. How early? Because many of the times in early scenarios, many of our patients don't need it. They get recovered by themselves by standard care. So uh, Dr. Petrick and we were discussing that uh, he has given a timeline of around six hours, if you see in his cytosol views. If a patient has started to having a precipitated sepsis and you used your standard of care and initially four to six hours you are not able to stabilize, you are requiring escalating doses of vasopressors, that is probably the time where you should consider of using one of them. And at that point of time, then the second question comes, what is my filter? So the filter, the now first discussion is if my patient after the basic standard care is not improving within four to six hours and they are going down with escalated doses of Norad and vasopressin, I need to initiate, I have taken a decision, then what filter? Then we were discussing about using some assays like uh, you are dealing with a gram negative endotoxemia or it is more of a cytokine storm, depending on that and then adding, do you need any renal replacement therapy in them? If suppose I have a patient who has an acute kidney injury, I have a sepsis who is getting down, I have a suspicion of endotoxin and cytokine storm which is playing all the role, probably I have to choose a device which can take care of all of them in the form of auxiliaries. In, in only the disadvantage will be, you need to have a plasma plex same machine with a CRRT component needing a cost of around maybe a lakh for dealing that. That will be one of the area of concern. The other three or four things which we said is the toramycin filter, which is uh, right now have a limited uh, availability with us, which we used a lot in the beginning. After as he pointed out, the recent trials which has not suggested strong in favor 
so has been dropped can be used as an endotoxin only purely to remove endotoxins then we are talking about other three or four things like cytosol or hemocyl which is again the same tore company came back and this ha330 which is again from a jafran we are all talking about removal of cytokines in permutation combination in them can be an alternative to them so again the second question is after you choosing the filter how long how many how many uh, times and uh, that what has been discussed in all of you so all of them have the different timelines where you can use for 24 hours and beyond that in a auxiliary filter in the circuit whereas the tore we use are 2 hours per day for two sessions and whereas cytosol we said 4 to 6 hours which can be repeated so all those have a different different timeline hemocyl as vamsi was saying we have been using to 12 hours up to 12 hours in many of our circuits so this different has different timelines and number of sessions required most of them are at two sessions to three to four maximum sessions has been utilized in them but again in india the cost availability all will matter so in situations where there is a cost limitation probably these cares which are not into the standard of therapy can be probably put into a hold only standard care can be continued no um, as i said earlier i fully agree so far, no single um, sorbent or nor uh, filter has been proved to be effective to improve survival. Uh, the only um, uh, aspect that we could rely on some uh, study, some pilot randomized study and some mostly retrospective studies, the improvement of hemodynamics. And therefore, I'm coming back to what I said before. We should not right away looking for a destination therapy, improving survival with this type of um, sorbent or uh, filter, but we should look for bridge therapy by reducing perhaps the um, cytokine load or endotoxin load, allowing to a, another therapy that can cure the patient. And so it's really in that setting that we have to think about this kind in selected patient, obviously. And mostly we need to do more study, mechanistic study. I spoke a lot uh, about this because there are a lot of things we do not know, especially of the course of sepsis. I described uh, five different cores of sepsis coming from the Hodgkiss initial uh, scheme, which are very, very different. And we wrote a, a full paper on this. And there are probably 10 to 15 to 20 different cores. So we need to identify the course of the patient by measuring initially IL-6, IL-10, endotoxin, and then monitoring it to know what we are doing. If we have no monitoring, then we have to see if the need of vasopressor is reascending, and then we know that we are not effective anymore, maybe due to um, uh, a completely struck uh, filter or solvent. But um, it is very too early to speak about randomized controlled study because there are so many things that we need to know before. If we do right now a randomized controlled study, for all this device, we will fail because we do not know what we are trying to do. So we need mechanistic study for me for the next five, ten years. And before we, and at that time, when we understand completely what we are doing, perhaps we can launch some randomized control study. If we do this right now, like the company wants to do, to make money, they will lose a lot of money because all the randomized control study will be negative. 